Welcome everyone to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. I'm very excited after quite a few months of trying to coordinate our diaries. I've got Matt Kendall on the other line. We met, it's a few years ago now, where I did a talk at your platform, Interesting Talks, which no longer exists, but it was running for about seven years. Is that right? Yeah, it sort of exists a little bit. Oh, it exists it. sort of, okay. Um, so, and I remember I was thinking about it, that was my very first talk where I talked personally about my story. Mm. So I'd done loads of teaching and training and other people's content and things like that. But that was the first platform where I was like, oh, I think I cried on stage. It was all going on, um, but it was a good experience. So thank you for that. Welcome you did, to you did too, because you came back as well. Oh yes, I did, didn't yeah. I? Yeah. I did a second one, I did a second mm. one. Um, it was good, good experience for me and a great audience. Um, and you were running that for a while. Now, Matt, give our listeners just a little bit of insight into you. What do you do? I know you're like a serial entrepreneur. You've always got a new idea going. Give us the, the nutshell version of what's going on in your life. So as you were saying about Interesting Talks, Interesting Talks was a meetup group which I started um, about, eight, I think it's eight years ago now. I think it's about yeah. the 11th of January or something that started it in 2012. And I, I, I used to like listening. Well, it all started when I was at school and we actually had this guy come in and to talk about um, drug smuggling. Well, not drug smuggling, but uh, taking drugs through customs. And I, I absolutely loved it. You know, and he was just showing the different concealments and everything. And I just thought, I want to do this as a job. And if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, because I watch all the things on YouTube, you know, the locked up abroad and customs yeah, and, and I'd love to do that not the immigration side and I don't find that interesting but or or taking food but all the drug concealments I found absolutely fascinating and so I always like listening to interesting talks from interesting people not so much inspirational stuff um when I was much younger I, I listened to some Tony Robbins and I found it quite interesting but then I grew to really despise most of that kind of material and so I, when I was in, so when I was in uh, London, I moved to London ten years ago, and I thought there's this platform called Meetup. I like listening to interesting talks. I was working like a coaching sort of area. I had lots of access to different people. I thought, well, I like organising things. I've always organised things. You know, I used to run business events and all that kind of stuff. You know, when I lived in Manchester, I used to run networking events. I thought, how hard can it be? Because I used to run, I used to run band nights. Now, when you've got a band night, you've got security, you've got four bands, you've got bar stuff, you've got all these. So running an actual speaking event is actually very easy compared to running something as complex as that. And it was, and I actually just find organizing stuff relatively easy because I'm very methodical and you know, I'm very sort of precise and how, how to do things and creating systems. I mean, but also Matt, you're saying it's easy. I find event, event planning horrific. It is not my skill set. So I like showing up and doing the work and knowing that because there is a lot of steps, just the marketing perspective and visibility and getting the right people in the room and the right speaker and like tech and, you know. It, it, it is. And the thing is, you know, it's like, but I, I find doing other stuff difficult. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but the things I've been, so people go to me, why, you know, how come you're so confident on stage stuff? It's because I started doing it when I was 15. Yeah. Um, so I've been doing it, you know, over half my life. And so, so when you were 15, was that soon after you'd seen this talk and it excited you? And then I you actually, do you know what? It was about the same time period. No, I actually started doing stand-up comedy. Uh, when Did I was you? 15, yeah. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, it was That's quite bizarre because I, yeah, I was only 15 and I thought, because my dad was a professional speaker. Okay. After dinner speaker. And so I, I just sort of... Um, I thought, right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do this then, obviously. This was the days before YouTube and Instagram and Facebook. So if I, I feel really sorry for like people that age now because everything you do now is committed to history digitally. Right. Yes. Um, and so, you know, I think people take much less risks um, publicly doing things performance-wise than they ever have done because of the embarrassment factor mm. and so i i started sp speaking in clubs and comedy and i was so young they had to sneak me in through fire exits and stuff so the managers didn't see and it was quite novel to have a 15 year old on at a comedy club and i i went off to university in manchester and i got through to the semi-finals of there's a, com a competition called so you think you're funny 
And it's a very prestigious event. A lot of people have won it. Um, like famous people now have kind of won it. And I was playing football. Um, well, I wasn't playing football. I was revising. And I was in the park. And I, the ball came to me as I was walking away. And I turned to kick it. And because I wasn't warmed up or anything, I kicked it quite hard. I pulled a muscle in my lower spine. And my back went into spasm. And the, the, um, the final was in Edinburgh. And I couldn't go um because i put my back out and yeah. so that was and i had to miss all my exams at university for the first year so that was that kind of disappointing so what i decided to do and the thing is when you do comedy there's an expectation of doing comedy and i thought i, I didn't like that expectation the thing is if somebody doesn't find something funny they are right it's because they don't find it funny sure so i've actually got the best of both worlds now so when i do because i do a lot of my own talks on IEMT and I do social circles and lots of different stuff and I talk about quite serious stuff but I, I understand the mechanics of comedy so I kind of have the best of both worlds there's no expect there's no expectation to be funny I can play it straight if it's a more serious audience so I did a lecture for 200 odd people at the weekend university if you've heard of it which was at um, Burbeck I believe that's 200 psychology students and they don't have a sense of humor <laughs> and so they really don't. And so I did it very much straight. But when I'm doing more social events, like through funding or through interesting talks, I can make it much funnier and people aren't expecting it. And so if it goes well, it goes really well. If it doesn't, I just don't do it. It's like with a comedian, if things aren't going well, they can't then just not be funny because that is their job. So I've had, I do sort of have the best of both worlds in that sense. And so I started, um, interesting talks anyway and it, I, I just found it quite easy to kind of run because again I'm quite methodical and but basically these are how long it runs for this is, and I like the social elements of it um, because London is a very very lonely city and yeah. it's so I wanted a meetup as a platform where people come and meet each other and you know get together Wasn't and, it quite yeah. risky for you I, I remember way back when when you were telling me your history that before you came to London to do interesting talks what was happening right before what role were you playing or what were you doing? So I remember it was a bit disappointing or something, and then you decided on interesting talks. Well, I was living in Manchester, yeah. and I'd been to, so I'm originally from York, and I moved to Manchester when I was a 18 to go to university. And I did a, a degree that was absolutely pointless, but this was like 20 odd years ago, and this is when you could do a degree that was pointless because, you know, you don't have the expense of, I don't know how much it would cost to do a degree these days. I think it'd be about 50 grand with all the, you know, with all the, yeah. and it was, it, was, it was called media technology. And I knew within the first couple of weeks, I didn't want to do it. Um, but I continued doing it. The thing is, they were teaching us stuff saying, just to let you know, what we're teaching you is already out of date. So enjoy your next three years. Literally, it was like that. And so, but it was just on the cusp of, social media this was like 2000 and no 1999 sure. so it was before everything kind of really got yeah. going and so i was doing a lot of sort of you know working recording studios making my own projects do, doing tv film um and there's a lot of maths and stuff involved but i just had no interest in but what it did kind of tell me about what it did sort of teach me was sort of like this either works or it doesn't and I've kind of used that sort of mentality, that kind of sort of engineering kind of mentality in therapy. It works or it doesn't. It, there's no kind of gray areas. Either this works or it doesn't work. And I was, um, so I finished university. I was running these band nights. And then I, I was really interested in NLP. Um, I was very much interested. This is when Darren Brown was really famous. Oh, yeah. and McKenna. And I was yeah. really interested in about the mind, um, not, not psychology interestingly but just the mind and sort of hypnosis and this is when hypnosis was on, on tv quite a bit and and um it was like hypnotherapy was starting to become a thing you know it's like and obviously nlp was a was a real 90s thing really and that was sort of you know, that was sort of still hanging around and i i was i started a um i was working at bt and I was always running my own companies. I didn't want to work at BT, but it was a suitable follow-on from my degree. So I was doing broadband. Uh, I, basically, I was coordinating engineers and fixing broadband lines. Uh, but I was running my own companies from there as well. And apparently, this is called gross misconduct. 
Uh, I was having meetings in their meeting rooms. I was using their postage, their franking system. But anyway, they uh, they were not happy about me. I was there for three years, and I, I worked, and I was very good at my job. I just didn't do it very often. Sure. And so, <laughs> and so, um, and I actually remember I, I left. Well, <laughs> I was escorted, escorted off the premises. It was very dramatic. Very dramatic, yeah. And I remember I was escorted off the premises and I thought, I'm going to have to call my parents. And my parents have paid for me to go to university and all my funding and everything. And I was like, I was really dreading having to call them. You know, because my parents are very proud Yorkshire, you know, very hardworking. And I called them and my dad saw partially that so he couldn't hear me. So I spoke to my mum and said, just to let you know, I have been... Uh, released from my contract <laughs> released and, and um my mum actually said to me well i think it's time you actually did something you enjoyed and okay. i was like right it was quite emotional i was like okay and so i started running these band nights more seriously and i started running networking events and i actually started to run an online print and design studio because i was buying so much printing to do with the band nights so this guy liked my attitude about working and customer service and he goes, I want to run this studio. So I was running an online print and design studio. I had two full-time designers, one in Wales, one in Scotland, never met them. And I was coordinating all this design. And I got really interested in marketing. So my flatmate at the time was a carpet cleaner. His dad owned a carpet cleaner. And I got all these tapes called Piranha Marketing by a guy called Joe Polish. And I started listening to all these marketing, direct response marketing. And so I had a real good education in marketing. Like boot camps of DVDs of like, or like... Again, it's for carpet cleaning. It was about direct response. And I just watched it all and I was fascinated. And so I started to build up quite a profitable online design studio. And then I started running business events and I started working from an office. And then I met a hypnotherapist at a business event. And he gave me this piece of paper and said all these things which he did. And he goes, would you like to be hypnotized for £10? And I was like, of course I do. Yeah. You know, Does he ask you like for an outcome that you're looking to achieve? No. Or it's just like, <laughs> no, he just yeah. says, Do you want to be hypnotized for ten pounds? I was like, Yeah, I I didn't think I had any problems. And sure. of course. <laughs> so I went along to his office and it was a very pokey little small office. On reflection, he was a terrible hypnotherapist and he had quite a bad lisp as well. So hypnosis was quite an interesting vocation for him to to sit down and relax. <laughs> I was like <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah he was he was pretty bad but basically so from this 10 pound thing he goes right i've identified all these problems you've gone to these six sessions i'm like okay and so i did i had six sessions it was about 300 quid which at the time about 20 years it was a lot and i found it interesting i found most of it hmm, but some of it i found genuinely interesting and he said to me at the end trained to be a hypnotherapist I was trained to be a hypnotherapist okay right. I was like, why he goes he goes go and train trust me there's something about you and your way of what is trained to be a hypnotherapist Which so, yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so I'm, okay fine so um <laughs> i had a lot of free time on my hands the thing is when i was running the print and design studio i wasn't doing anything because it was all automated it was all systemized um i was only needed if there was a problem which wasn't because the way i set stuff up it wasn't really an issue so I had a lot of free time and I was making, I wasn't making loads of money, but it meant that I only had to work like an hour a day, really. And I could do what I wanted with the rest of the day. So there's only so much daytime TV you can watch and stuff. So right. I started learning about hypnosis and I went on all these different courses and I read every book and did every course you could do and online trainings. And I did something really, really quite reckless. I, I went on to Gumtree and I said, I'm not qualified and I'm not insured, but I am free. If you'd like a session of hypnosis. And I saw hundreds of people at my house. You know, hundreds. I sometimes have people just turn up. Yeah. Um, I, this, I didn't have a website. You know, just people just turn up. Because on Gumtree, you have an endless supply of slightly crazy people. And I just had, and so my first ever person comes in and I said, so what, you know, what do you want help with smoking? Wait, and she goes, um, I had a stillborn baby eight months ago. And I was like, oh, so I started that's doing, that's, and yeah, that's, that's and, go into that. and the thing is it helped us so much. And I was like, oh, okay. And then this other guy comes to me who was quite ill. He was really overweight, like 
like, you know, you walk past him in the street, you go, that's a big man, kind of overweight. And I helped him. And I saw him at a networking event, my own networking event, a few months later. And he comes up and says, oh, hi, Max, how are you? And I was like, and I didn't know who he was. So I was like, yeah, okay, fine. Um, he goes, oh, that session that we did was really helpful. And I was like, I, I don't, who are you? I, I'm sorry. I just, uh, and it was, this, it was a guy called Gerald. In fact, I, Gerard, sorry. I've got an interview with him on my YouTube somewhere. And he lost eight stone in about six months. And I was like, you can recognize him. Yeah, I, I literally didn't know who he was. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I started getting really good at hypnosis. And I really liked a guy called Tom Silver, which was an American fellow who did something called emotion replacement therapy. It was very much bring, it was like the idiomotive response. So bringing up feelings in one hand, dropping it, bringing up the other. And he took a very scientific approach to it. He's a showman as well, but he took a very scientific approach to it. And I liked that. I don't really like positivity or putting happy feelings. I don't. I don't think it serves any purpose. But I, the thing is, if you have a problem, and if you put happy feelings, like live your best life and just think great, and what's the lesson we can learn here, and all that kind of nonsense, what you've got is not a solution. You've got a time bomb. You've still got this thing festering away, and it will come out at some point. And so, so if you're saying if you're sort of um, papering over the cracks, so it's, it's putting a bandage over a broken ankle, you know, it's not, you're not dealing with the problem. And so when I started working with people, I always say, well, what's the problem? Not what do you want, which I know is a very coaching. What's your well-formed outcome? I always say my outcome is I can make your life less shit. Okay. And that's it. I can make your life less shit. Yeah. And so the thing is, if you have a, a graph, uh, to, so say that you have super happiness and really unhappy, right? What people tend to do, this is normal. If you're down here, it's like if you push a ball uh, beneath the surface of water, it wants to shoot up really high. So if you feel crap and depressed, low self-esteem, whatever label is going around, you want to shoot up really high. Well, you can't stay up there forever. So what's going to happen? You're going to come down. You're going to go down even further. So what happens, you live a very, very unstable or even a bipolar type of existence where you're going from one extreme to another. And the self-development industry love this because when you're feeling down, there's always another course, there's always something else to sell you and to make you feel great. And unfortunately, a lot of the self-development industry is about mindset and not skill sets. And it makes uneducated people feel powerful. And that's unfortunately how it's, what it's based on it's making yeah uneducated people feel powerful because they sometimes because they want to make you think that mindset is more important than skill set and i think that's yeah. entirely wrong i actually agree with that so um when you were saying um like positivity or you know that that's not worthwhile my my mind just to put in my own opinion is that actually there's science behind gratitude practices for example that allow your mindset to connect with the other side like a shift of perspective right um, I, I i have no problem stuff like that so i have no problem let me make something clear i have absolutely no problem with anybody trying to better themselves of course that's not my enemy my enemy are the industrial companies i've seen it yeah i i've worked behind you know i got into these things and i i i've seen people getting up I, I won't name companies or people but yeah. i've seen people get abused yeah, I'm sort of abused. Yeah, and um, by these industrial and they target certain people. They target people. It's formulaic, and it's like you can see the cell. Like once you know what the industry is like, you can see the process. And equally, I mean, I was raised in a cult, so yeah. it feels very <laughs> like you know I am the leader who changed your life, sort of thing. But I love what you said about mindset, not skill set. So it's not useful to just be like think like this. I mean, our thoughts have power. But if we think like this, but we don't then put the habits in place to develop our skill set, well, it, I, you can't you have one without the other, I would have there's, thought. There's a, brilliant, there's a brilliant quote I once heard, and I, I wish I wrote it. And it's that mindset without skill set makes for a happy idiot. And I just, I just think it's true. So you have these people and around the NLP community and around a lot of this positivity community, you know, doing a fire walk in a hotel car park in September, being helped on by some divorcees. What's going on? This isn't, this isn't mental health. This is, again, putting so much 
positivity and feeling great and making your move and roaring and letting out and being authentic. I, I find that people who say they're authentic is just an excuse to be rude. I'm just being my authentic self. No, you're an asshole. You're just being rude. And yeah. so I really, so although I was in the self-development industry, and I, I still am, I suppose, I, I hate most of it. And so I kind of came to it a very kind of like, I'm from the north of England. Cynical. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm also, does this work? Yeah. Does Is this there work an or actual not? outcome? Yeah. And I'm, I'm very much into creating value for people. You know, all the events that I've ever run have been the best value things you can attend. And you get so much value from, you know, from attending as well. Absolutely. And that's how I've kind of built my, my businesses and my little empire, I suppose. And so I, I started getting really good at hypnosis and I started working more and more with men uh, because men really like my approach because I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I don't really want to talk about the problems. And so I was developing techniques and tools and strategies to help work in a content free way of working. So that basically means you don't need to talk about the experience, just the structure of the experience and how it affects you. So I started working with a lot of guys who'd been through a lot of physical and mental abuse, guys who'd been bullied. And, and that naturally led on to me going into what's called the pickup industry or the dating industry. Well, I had no intention. Um, it's just a lot of stuff to do with confidence is brought into relationships. I never liked, and then obviously there's the whole thing about the game. That was pretty big at the time, Neil Strauss and all those kind of things. Yeah. Kind of and I moved to London and I moved to London because I was unhappy in Manchester. And um, I was going through a very, very weird time in Manchester. I, I was kind of, I was pretty stagnant. I had a very successful therapy business that I was running from a, a gym um, on Key Street, which is the centre, mid Dean's Gate. And I was working with people there. And, uh, but then I, I, I did some courses in London and I kept coming down to London. I was like, London's really good. And um, back home in Manchester, my, my flatmate at the time, his dad's company, the carpet cleaning company, they had been missold a large insurance contract to take all this insurance work and it actually fell through. It never materialized. And so they were going to sue the person. The person who was suing then died. So they couldn't sue the person. So they, they lost the whole business. And then the rest, you know, and the credit crunch was now kicking yeah. out. So it's like 2008 now. And it got to a point where his dad was living on our sofa because he'd lost everything. And it was a very strange and stressed time to be. And I was sick of the rain because <laughs> it rains a lot, you know. And so I kept coming down to, to London. And my sister was an artist, or she still is an artist, and she was living in a tiny studio, like, I mean, tiny studio. Yeah. And she said, look, if you ever want to move to London, you can move down, you can live with me until you get yourself sorted. So I went, okay, cool, yeah, fine. And I'm very suggestible. When people say, suggest me to do something, but like, yeah, okay, um, yeah, fine. And I've got the time. And so I went back to Manchester, and I said to my flatmate, I, I'm going to move to London um, next month. I think, I think it was like six weeks time or something like that. And he was like, w w why, what do you mean? And I just said, look, I'll, I'm no longer really sort of very happy in Manchester. A lot of my friends had moved away that I was at university with. My social circle was kind of decreasing and decreasing. And I was just a bit bored and I, I'd been there for 10 years. So I said, um, I'm going to move to London. I'm going to go try my luck in London, basically. I'm going to be like Dick Whittington. Yeah, but, like a rest. And, yeah. And I remember I, I arrived in London and he was like, he understood why I wanted to go and he was fine. I'm still I'm good friends with him now and you know, I speak to him regularly and I go up to Manchester and stuff. And um, I, I, moved, I moved down and I had two bags. Of, I had my laptop and a bag of clothes and that was it. And I, I, came, I got into King's Cross and there was some sort of terror alert going on. And, I was like, <laughs> and so Welcome. it was like armed police, everything running around. I was like, oh. And so I thought, this isn't good. And then I went to, so I live in an area called Muswell Hill, which is in North London, a very sort of leafy, yummy, mummy. Yeah. Great, very nice area. And I sat outside Starbucks and I'd been in and I, was ne I stood next to John Sim, the actor. And I thought, it's all right here. <laughs> <laughs> I like celebrity spotting. And um, 
And I just thought, yeah, this seems much more like me. And then the weather is different here. I know it sounds that, but Manchester, it's got its own ecosystem because of where it is with the Pennines. And it and people joke about how much it rains. It, it rains a lot and it becomes depressing, especially if you work from home and you don't need to go out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're just stuck in, literally stuck in. And so I was very, uh, and so I do think your environment has a huge impact on how you feel. Yeah. Where right. you are and who you're with really sort of impacts you. So I moved in with my sister and it was so small i couldn't even put the futon down because she can then get she can get out of bed uh because she lived on a bed deck and i thought what am i gonna do <laughs> you know because i had no plan i literally had no plan but i also had nothing to lose so and i think that puts you in a a really good place in life it's just like let's just have a go yeah What's the worst that can happen what's what's the risk here and I didn't have a mortgage. I wasn't in a relationship. And I thought the, the very worst is that I'll move back home to York with my parents. You know, go back, table to my legs, and probably go back to Manchester. You know, apologise to everyone. And But it worked out because I, I contacted this guy who was running this big dating agency place. And he, they gave me a trial. They said, OK, we've got this guy who's doing a premium week course. Costs thousands of pounds, to like four or five grand to do He's going to go, and if he goes, we will lose four because we'll have to refund him. If you can convince him to stay or help him, we will take. So I went, okay, so I went in, and I worked with this guy for an, for about two hours and really, really helped him. And I was got invited, so they used to do a boot camp weekend every weekend, and I walked into this uh, weekend boot camp, and this guy stood up in front of like eighteen guys and all the trainers and was just saying how much I helped him. So I was then I was then started working there. That was kind of like my way in. Yeah. And so I, I worked at, so I was very against the whole misogynistic thing. My ideal clients through the dating, I, I used to work with women as well, were people who had come out of a long-term relationship. They're in their thirties or forties. They just kind of felt lost, had low self-esteem, not much of a social circle and just wanted to rebuild their life. That was my perfect, my perfect client. Yeah. Not an 18-year-old that just wants to run around chatting at girls. And, and so sure. and so I started doing that. And at about the same kind of time, I got invited down to Brighton to meet this guy who I've met on a forum, which sounds wrong now. And he said to me, he goes, do you want to come to a, a training event, a half-day workshop by a guy called Andrew Austin about moving your eyes and stuff? And I was like, yeah, fine. Because again, we've, we found out I'm suggestible. So we went along and, and I'd never heard of eye movement therapy or EMDR or anything. Yeah. I walked in and I meet Andrew Austin and he's a character. He's a real character, Andrew Austin. He, go, he goes to me, do you have a memory, a negative memory, which just stands out, a negative memory? And I was like, yes, I do. Hold it. And then it starts to move my eyes. And he goes, what's that now like? And at that moment, I realized that my whole life, career, and everything I knew about therapy was going to change. It's what happens, and this is called IEMT, Integral Eye Movement Therapy. And what it does, it takes your experience and it takes you out of it. It makes it objective. So when you think of a negative experience, you're usually subjective. That means you're seeing it like you're there. It's usually high quality. Because of the way it's encoded through the limbic system, it's there to keep, to keep you safe, essentially, and your brain's yeah. acting like it's going to happen again. Yeah. So when you move the eyes, we don't quite know exactly how it works. It sends signals, we believe, to the hippocampus when you move the eyes in certain ways. And you literally look at the event from who you are today. And it completely changes how you feel about it. So are you saying that it, it changes immediately, like just that one eye yep. processing um, event? It changes process? it straight away. It carries on and it does other stuff as well. And this is only just one small element of the actual process. And I was, I just sat there going, at ah. because you can achieve similar results with NLP with the submodalities moving, changing, swish, and all these different things. But this was like doing it automatically. And I was, I was absolutely baffled. And, and so, like, what about, so let me just give some context to trauma and all of that. So I'm currently yeah. doing some therapy called somatic experiencing. 
which is about body release and your nervous system, I guess, gets um, hardwired into that survival mechanism, right? I've also done EMDR, um, mm -hmm. which was pretty powerful, but I wouldn't say it sort of cured me, but equally, I come from a perspective of having complex kind of trauma from different parts of my life. So, um, but there is just something around, what's fascinating to me is that you don't need your story. You don't need to like a therapy, like old school therapy is like, tell me about the trauma and you sort of relive the rape or the thing that, that happened, right? Yeah. You say it over and over again. And in a way it reinforces the story. It reinforces it. Doesn't it? it does. yeah, yeah. And so what, what I've found fascinating is that you don't need to tell your story, but these things are stored, as you say, in, in your limbic system, your survival, your nervous system, your body. And actually, if we can work with releasing, maybe that's a different, I don't know if that's the right word from your perspective, but- I prefer reprocessing. So reprocessing the trauma in some way, mm. you change, it doesn't go away, but you change your relationship to it. Okay, so I have a light on in my room here, okay? okay, as you can probably tell. I can turn that light off. It's still there, but there's no energy going to it anymore. And yeah. that's the way I like to sort of think about it. Okay. So you know, you don't remove the memory, you reprocess the memory and you readdress your relationship with it. So I've been doing a lot of research into this and one of my friends is a neuroscientist who came to one of my courses who was just fascinated. And from what I understand about trauma encoding into the memory, you have different levels of the memory. You have sensory memory, short term, long term, and your hippocampus and your amygdala play a vital role in the limbic system to do with encoding of the memory. So generally what happens is that your amygdala, small little you know, organ about the size of an almond, and you have a hippocampus, which looks like a seahorse behind it. Your amygdala regulates fear, emotion, and the quality, the submodalities of the memory. So basically what you're visually seeing and how much fear is uh, attached to this memory. The hippocampus then works like a filing system. So it takes that memory and puts it into the long term. Okay. When you're experiencing trauma, everything slows down because what's happening, there's the more emotion and stimulus and energy um, this, that's going on at the time of what I call encoding, so basically just what's happening, the amygdala works better and the hippocampus works, uh, is impaired. So what happens, you know when people say it was like it was in slow motion? Mm -hmm. That's because your amygdala is, like, is taking on everything. But that can't then be stored properly in the hippocampus so you sort of freeze don't you it freezes. yeah and the hippocampus becomes overwhelmed and so it can't put it into long-term memory where it belongs so it kind of keeps it just around essentially it doesn't get fully processed the way i like to think about this is like if you imagine a, a library you have a librarian on a desk and you have books coming in which is like the memory or the, the sensory acuity or the sensory information if you bring a book in to the librarian, she then takes that book and goes and files it and comes back, gets another one. Mm -hmm. That system works well. In trauma, it's like a thousand books turning up at once. Yeah. And it breaks the system. So what we do is we hold on to these memories. It's like um, if you're running a laptop, you've got open windows. You can minimize them, but they're still there. They're and it uses a lot of energy, like you're saying. It's draining, it's exhausting, behind the and, scenes, your body. And also, when, when you're running your laptop with a lot of open windows, it, it's, everything runs poorly, okay? Also, it's easily to trigger open, um, and you can have what I call like pop-ups, so like intrusive thoughts and flashbacks. Yeah. Okay? What IEMT does, it opens up this memory and closes it. It just closes it, puts it into the long-term storage, because what happens to you when you were 17 or nine or something is important when you were then but the thing is the way that trauma works is that it's, it's a brilliant book i recall what when the past is always present your brain is geared up for this thing that happens to you to happen again so people live on edge people live with anxiety and so i've worked with a lot of people who've come back from conflict um from afghanistan and even like a little noise or a doorbell they it sets them off because they are still mentally there mm -hmm. but they're not there they're in you know warrington or you know in london they're not in afghanistan or basra but the same can happen and so what what happens is that when you have these triggers you mentally regress back to 
then yeah. and your the way of responding from then and so um and this can be very true and the thing is it's like I, I deal with people who have uh by public speaking for example because when they were younger they got you know because the british school system is great at traumatizing people mm -hmm. and so you get up and speak in front of people or you see other people do it and it's just as bad because you still take it on so what happens in present day when you have a stimulus or a trigger you mentally regress back to that age and you're able to respond from that age not from who you are now so what iemt does it allows you to go back to these sensitizing events but with your life experience going back to that problem and so it allows it to be resolved the way that i tell people it's like you know your sort of favorite kids programs when you think about your favorite kids programs you're thinking about what it was like when you were nine years old watching it okay not what it's like now sure. if you watch your favorite kids program now you'll be like this is yeah. very different but it's not changed you've changed and therefore when when you change the way you look at something the thing that you look at actually changes and it's basically the same with iemt in my opinion so when um when you go back to from who you are now back to these sensitized so what sensitizing events is just the imprint of when the, you know when it first was new um you go back to these events but as you are now because you're anchored into the present you look at these things and basically the significance and the meaning just drops it's like well of course that's not a problem but don't you find that you can you can know like i can know that cognitively yeah that the experience then isn't a problem i can chat about it i can analyze Absolutely. it be like i am a strong independent powerful woman and that bother me but then in certain moments my body doesn't know that of right? course and so, so what happens what happens the thing is knowing about a problem is knowing about it and right. when you actually when you know what the problem is but you want to do something so you have these feelings it's cognitive dissonance you yeah. want to do something but you have all this stuff stopping you yeah with imt what it does is it finds this feeling you use the feelings to go to the imprint and then you process the imprint you work on these imprints so it basically smooths it out so now when you want to do that thing you're basing it on evidence and what's with what's actually there not because of your association to the past yeah yeah so, so you um, get to see it from for what it is basically get some distance from it and decide yeah. how you want to respond yeah absolutely it gives you choices so you could respond the way that you did or you don't have to if you have a rat that's running around in a box if you lift that box up the rat could run the way it was or it can just do anything else sure so you have choice now talk yeah. us just through you've given us some clues about the process of it it's about your eye movement and about yeah. kind of bringing in a memory or something yeah but somebody who's never done any trauma therapy and might even not recognize that they have trauma mm -hmm. in their life first of all what types of things are iemt um, specifically good for because maybe there's certain things that it really works and then like what's the first session like what is the process so somebody can feel a bit confident about like oh maybe i should access this okay so uh, you'll either get you have two types of clients people who know what the problem is and people who don't yeah and that's generally sort of the thing they know they're sad they're unhappy they're anxious but they don't know why yeah so with imt there's a little bit of investigation work so we look at the feelings which they currently have and you use the now imt does not work on emotion it works on the imprints that are causing the emotion it's like imagine uh, it's like a speaker and sound okay the sound is the emotion the speaker is the imprint the memory which is causing it you can't do anything to the sound you can only stop the speaker sometimes that speaker's in a different room sure so you need somebody to actually help you to find what it is yeah and it usually goes back to very small things it really does but the things that small thing when you're seven is a big thing such as getting lost in a supermarket getting lost at the beach or something like that very very common it doesn't have to be some major stuff no no it usually isn't okay. it's usually very small incidences um but it can still impact your of course. yeah day -day. because what happens you then have compounding experiences which create a belief system yes and then you have these belief and you know there's nothing stronger than belief and you then use then you then justify having this belief Yes. so for, for example say that you're at school and a teacher says to you you're stupid you didn't know that before now you know it like i'm stupid 
So you're now looking, you know, your brain is now aware of this and you're basically taking on compounding uh, memories, which creates this belief system. It's like if you're going to go buy a new jacket and you go into like a uh, top shop or something and you see this jacket and you think, oh, I'm going to buy it, you go out and then you see lots of other people in that jacket, which you'd never noticed before because you didn't know it existed. Yeah. It's the same with a, a belief system in a sense. So you, you experience this thing and, you, and then you have this solid belief system. And you, we keep away from this belief system so we don't trigger it. So we design our lives to not go near these almost like these landmines. So if you think so, if you think you're stupid, but say you want to go for a job and you want to go for this interview, we feel very nervous and you go, right, actually, I'm not going to go for it because I don't want to work the extra hours. I didn't want to. So you justify why you don't do it. But the reality is you don't want to do it because you feel bad. You feel stupid because when you were seven, a teacher said you were stupid. But saying that doesn't sound crazy. So what I help people to do is, on this side, the people who don't know the problem, we go back to these imprints and basically resolve them. So you can go and do that thing much easier yeah, than, so you uh, than, push, than trying to push through it. You know, you sort yeah. of minimise the, the experience. The other, so that, so, with, so anxiety, we look at how anxiety is structured and we work with people. So that's people who don't know what the problem is. People who do know what the problem is, so I've worked with people who have been, uh, just some of my recent cases, uh, a guy when he was nine years old, he was in a stolen car with his mum and her mum's boyfriend, who was very high on drugs and drunk. And this guy crashed the car and killed his mum in the car. <gasps> right? That's, That's when he was nine. Serious point. Yeah, and he's in his 20s now and he's never, never been all right. So no amount of therapy is going to solve that. No. But... We can stop the hate for the guy. We can, uh, and the, the, his lasting memories of his mum is her face crushed against the steering wheel and bleeding. Which so when he thinks about his mum, that's deep. what. Yeah. So we we sort of fixed all that up, and again by getting them into the memory, moving his eyes. So now when he thinks of his mum, he remembers his mum, and he doesn't care about that guy. Now it's not about forgiving anyone or anything. It's just so now he can sleep at night. He can actually go out and trust people, and you know what I mean. Uh, something else, uh, a boy who I worked with who was 17 recently, 17, 18, something really bad happened when he was 10 with his dad. We don't know what it was, and I, I don't, don't really care, to be honest. Um, you don't need the story. No, no, no. And in the last couple of weeks, he has reconnected with his dad, um, been to see him. He's gone back to college. His anxiety's dropped. You know, he's reducing his medication. Um, I worked with a woman who got trapped in a lift during 9-11. Uh, during the terror attacks and then she came to london and she was in london for the bombings again no. in a lift yeah oh. and so she's waiting for the third thing yeah so and she lives in manhattan and as you know it's a vertical city so so i helped her use the lift um a guy who i helped in dallas was on a roof he was a he's a property developer and there was a freak gust of wind and he nearly got blown off the roof so he couldn't even go above a second floor and so he was losing work because he was going to meetings and he was shaking and people thought, why, why is he nervous? And yeah. so he was losing. And so he was having to justify all. So again, we just made it so he felt okay. Um, and this is all through IEMT. So, yeah, so I, I, I need like two sessions with people. Yeah. Um, I'm not a long-term solution. I'm, uh, if you need counseling, this is not care and support. This is change work. It's... Um, Imagine me as like a dentist, right? You doing your brushing your teeth every day is care and support. Yeah. I'm there to pull your tooth out to do a filling or an implant. Okay. I don't care how it's happened. That's not my, you know, yeah. I'm just there to fix the thing. And then you need to go and now some people will come to work with me for two sessions. I will then refer them to somebody else for continuing support. You might work. need both, right? You might yeah, need absolutely, both. absolutely. But also, a lot of the time, people need to learn a skill set, and I can help them with the emotion. So a lot of people come to me and go, "Right, I've seen you on stage, or I've seen, and I want to be a really good public speaker." I'm like, okay, well, these are all the training courses. Oh well, no, I have stage fright. I can help you with the stage fright. I can't make you a good public speaker. So I can help with the emotion. I can then send you to go and do the, the course. And you need but, to practice. Yeah. But doing the course without all the anxiety, you're going to learn to much faster rates. And, you know, it's just much easier to do it. So Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating just to approach 
even just anxiety or, or depression or some of the things that people face from a trauma perspective. Mm. You, that was fascinating where you might not know what the trauma was or that there was any, but this could still be a relevant approach to you just because you can see negative impact on your day-to-day -day life. Basically, the worse that something's happened to you, generally the more I can help you. You know, that's the worst that you are. I, I, the worst kind of person for me to work with is somebody who's just... They don't, they just, I, just, I want to be motivated or something, you know what I mean? That kind yeah. of, there's you nothing wrong. And yeah. Can, right? yeah. But it's just, what do you want? I don't know. I'm just a bit unhappy. Um, I, I can't really do anything for you. If somebody comes to you, what happened? Well, I, I got stabbed four years ago and I haven't been back to work since. Right, we're off to the races. This is something which I can really, really help. In fact, I had this guy. Now, everything I talk about, I've, Got permission to do so i've done interviews i do a lot on my youtube channel i do half an hour interviews with past clients like half an hour really in-depth interviews just uh, go on youtube matt kendall you can find hours and hours of material on there um this guy came to do my training course the other week he's from manchester he was a teacher and he's a big guy he's like six foot two six foot three big big mancunian fella uh skinner guy and bit PE teacher bill and um he, he was working in this pretty bad school and one day there was this pretty reckless, you know, juvenile. And he, this guy beat the crap out of this teacher in a corridor and uh, nobody came to help him. Since then, his career has gone off a cliff. Uh, it's been really hard. He hasn't been back to that school, all this kind of stuff. He came to do my training course. And when you do the training course, you get a lot of work done on yourself because you're working with 11 different therapists in the, you know, in the same room. And I actually do demos at the front, and I did a demo with this guy about the PTSD model, and we worked on this particular problem. That night, he was out in London, and because he's not a Londoner, he didn't realise you shouldn't use your phone in the street because you'll get mugged, you know, standard practice. And he was around London Bridge area, and he came out of a, like a, a food shop or something, and these four guys surrounded him. He was on his phone. Now, usually, that would have sent him into a spiral. His legs would have gone, he would have run up. What he did this time is he took his phone, turned it off, put it in his pocket, zipped his jacket up, popped his collar and said, evening lads, and walked through them and just kind of walked past them. And he, and he came the next day, because that was on the Saturday, Saturday night on the Sunday, said, how are you? Interesting story. And he told us this story in a very factual thing. This is what happened, this is what I did. How I would have responded would have been this way, but I was able to. So it's not about building the confidence up. It's about un taking away these underpinning problems. And he's now gone back to Manchester and is, he, he says he's gone back to the way he was before the incident, basically. He's got his natural confidence back. And yeah. so it really is very life-changing stuff and a very short approach. My favorite kind of clients are those who have had something really bad happen to them and it's changed the course of their life. Now, most people want to get back to the, what they were like before, but unfortunately, look what's in front of them now. So you can only move on from where you are now. So I work with a lot of people who have been sexually assaulted, physically assaulted, um, been in an accident, lost a limb, uh, seen something, being part of an accidental death. And, and uh, now the people that we're working with, we're getting a lot of people who, are, who, are, who have worked in the NHS and also the emergency services, so as you can imagine, working in the emergency services, you're taking on trauma on a yeah, regular basis. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, so IMT is, uh, so it stands for integral in, or integral eye movement therapy or technique, if you like. So we, it's a weekend course. And it's, so you don't have to be a therapist. It's open to all. But generally, the people who I like are, who are already therapists or working doctors, GP, or whatever it might be, who want to add this to their skills. So it's a, it's a weekend course. It's a very specific technique. And it works really well with coaching, so you can actually work, use it with different models as well. And we've just had CPD status, uh, continue professional development, uh, yeah, official status. Okay. Yeah, so that cool. means now we can really now sort of attract different types of people. I might even start running the, the courses from hospitals, to be honest. That's where. We're good and, idea. Yeah, we're doing much more research into it. Um, and it's a very sort of progressive and growing area. It's, it's a very exciting area to work in. And the feedback which I get from the people who do my course and how they've worked with them. Um, and I put them, I, I try to give as much evidence as possible. 
and to investigate people you know, have people investigate it because a lot of therapy especially like the sort of the the alternative therapy that work on a meridian system or something they're like oh it works because of you know magic and we don't like science <laughs> you know because you know imt is very much like we want you to investigate this and tell us how yes. it works yeah so, so it works on neurology as opposed to like you know magic and energy yeah, that's that's um, fascinating. Um, so we've got your YouTube channel you mentioned. We'll put that in the show notes. Where else can people find you if they're uh, looking to work with you or connect with you or come on a training course? Okay, if you want to come on a training course, I run them once a month from London. I'm probably going to be doing some around the country as well. It's iemtacademy.com. So iemtacademy.com. Um, I spend a lot of time on Facebook. You can just, I think it's the Matt Kendall, my name on that, something like that. But also I've got Facebook pages and groups. I've got, just type in IEMT Academy, you'll find me everywhere. If you just Google my name, Matt Kendall, yeah, I've got loads of stuff online. I've got a lot, a lot of talks and a lot of, um, on, where have I got loads of stuff? On LinkedIn, I've got loads and loads of people on LinkedIn. And again, I've got a lot of LinkedIn recommendations from other therapists and other people. Again, check everything out, you know. I'm, sure. And if you want to speak to the people who have worked, I've got a lot of interviews with people who I've worked with and a lot of people who I've trained. For so sure. come from both, both angles. So, yeah, Facebook. I'm, I do a little bit on Instagram, to be honest. That's not worth checking me out on. Um, I run something called Psych Talks, which is a monthly speaking event in London, which I'm just starting, which is just Psych, P-S-Y, P-S... P-S-Y-C-H-E? Yeah, 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 P-S-Y-C. Find you and put it in the show notes. Psych, psych, P-S-P-Y-S, psych talks.co.uk, I can't remember which way it goes around. P-S-Y-C-H talks.co.uk, which is a monthly event. It costs 10 or 20 quid or something. It's really cheap. And you get like four or five speakers uh, in a private members club, which is great. Sounds good. And I think that's yeah. about it. Basically, will... get me on Facebook. You message me on Facebook. I like talking. So if you, if you have any questions about it, I have also written uh, a handbook, basically like an intro. Uh, I called it the Complete Guide, which was a, a bit of a lie. It's, it's an intro to IEMT, completely free of charge. I'm not going to send you loads of emails and stuff. My training courses are always full. And I'm not trying to, you know, it's, it's kind of like if you like the sound of it and you like what other people are saying, get in contact. And I'm booked up now for a couple of months. You know, it's always a couple of months in advance booked up. Um, and I get different types of people coming to the course. I get those who are therapists who want to add it to their skill set, those people who want to get into therapy, and those people who have no interest in going to therapy. They just want to work on themselves. They want to work through their own problems. And that. so I train to all three levels. So anyone can come. Yeah, yeah. Anyone. So uh, we're coming to the end of our time. We'll add all that into the show notes. Finally... What do you think is the, the key skill set that you have developed that has allowed you to be successful in the way that you are? So what's maybe that foundation skill set? So I know you know IEMT, and, but mm -hmm. I've always admired your, your perseverance, your entrepreneurial skills, the yeah. way you adapt. I don't know. What do you think has been the core skill set? I think that I, I've always just sort of got on with stuff. Yeah, um, you just keep going, keep moving. Yeah, just go on, just go on. And the thing is, once you realize, and I know this sounds sort of, uh, people might find it depressing, people don't care about you. They don't care if you succeed. They don't care if you fail. All they care about is themselves. They don't care. I was on the tube the other day. There was this woman dressed as a fairy, and there's a guy further down dressed as a bear. No one, no one even looked at them. You know what I mean? So if you think about, oh, do you, do you care about this mistake I made 10 years ago? No, take a second. Don't be obsess over. Don't yeah, no one cares. Literally yeah. nobody cares. And we live in a very sort of vacuous society with Instagram where I know some people, if they put a picture, if they don't get a certain amount of likes, they're going to have a bad day. What, what's that about? Um, so I really do think that I don't like people who try really hard at stuff. Um, I, think it's, I think it's sort of desperation more than anything. Are you uh, saying that you haven't had to try hard for the work that you've gotten to? I, I, I've put effort in. Yeah. But, but I've worked harder. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Massively. Absolutely. Ma but the thing is, I live a very charmed life. You know, I get to do amazing work with people I really respect and help people that really need help. And I work maybe a few hours a day. Yeah. I, love I don't that. own a house. I don't, you know, but I could work much, much harder, make much more money, own a house, 
Oh, but will I have, so today I'm doing this interview, it's a Monday or something. Yes. This afternoon, I'm going to go down to the gym, I'm going to do like a couple of hours work, and then I'm going to go for a swim and use the gym. Tonight, I think I might go see a film, right? I could work really hard for a long time, so in 20 years' time, I could have the lifestyle I have now. Yeah, so it's thinking consciously what's the outcome that you want and about the lifestyle rather than just push, push, push for the sake of... Yeah, yeah, I, I just, and this is why I think sort of all these sort of, um, I, I don't believe that if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to get up at five in the morning, like, I've got, I've got the book, I'm, I'm going to throw it away, like five. the five, a, I got up at 5 a.m. and it was awful, <laughs> it was, it was awful, it was really cold and dark, it wasn't inspired, what a terrible way to live. Yeah, right? it really is an awful way to live. And I really hate people who read loads of books like that's an impressive. I read 50 books a year. What, what have you done? Yeah, this yeah, is the absolutely. important thing. Reading an autobiography is not work. <laughs> it's really not. And people who and people need mentors and all these different. Just get on with it. If, if, you're this, if you're creating something that doesn't have people who want to work with your stuff they want to buy you don't have a business yeah yeah, yeah. You, know, you don't have you've got to identify a need and then fulfill that need don't create the worst thing to do is create a product and service and then go and look for customers that's the most stupid thing in the world what you want to do is basically you want to almost be like a legal drug dealer in a sense you actually want to have something that there's a need for and a need and a desire for and then you basically tailor your services and your product to that audience. And you then just get constant feedback and develop and sort of change what you're doing. So the actual product and service that you're offering is not half as important as the feedback and the relationship you have with your, with your clients, your potential yeah. clients. And then you tailor what you're doing. So what I'm doing now is very different to what I was doing. I'm not running business networking events. I'm running, you know, training course. yeah i love that so it's taking action learning from what you act, you do and mm. um creating that feedback loop to then adapt how well, people become if you look at like i've been watching a lot of dragons den recently on youtube i don't know why you know when you click on one and then you go so like, yeah. and people become overly attached to their thing their product or their service and if you do that you know life moves on and so yeah there's always going to be people. So when, when I work with it, you know, if I was overly attached to hypnosis and hypnotherapy, I wouldn't have learned IMT. I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't be able to help the people the way that I help them. So if you're really overly attached to the thing that you do, or if you think that you're sort of important and attach too much meaning to that, you know, no job is beneath you. And so when I run events and stuff, I'm often putting out chairs and cleaning up stuff. You know, I'm not like, oh, I have people that. I will get my hands dirty and I will always be that level. You know what I mean? And I think that a lot of people when they're in business and especially in the coaching industry, when they get a little bit of success, they become really super arrogant and they're posting pictures of like, I'm working from Bali and all the seven figure. You know, and, I, and I know that they're Instagram culture. Oh, it's a, it is the Instagram culture. And, and I think that we have with this whole Instagram and people, pretending to be happy i am I'm, I'm, i think i'm the happiest person i know but i'm not positive i just like i like being me um yeah I'm, but i'm not i don't i don't jump out of bed in the morning i hate getting up in the morning but i'm very honest you know what i mean i'm very honest you know i drink far too much i i get angry i don't really get angry i'm grumpy i hate a lot of stuff but I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I'm happy you're that doing you and you're yeah, exactly. Content. Um, I love this. Uh, we've got to <laughs> we've got to finish this. Um, I have to say that I I don't fully agree with everything, but I think you're doing you, and I admire that. Right? I well, think that, you don't have to agree. I'm not saying yeah, you. Yeah, you know, it's, it doesn't. It's not going to affect my day. <laughs> you know. So well, exactly. And mm. so it's owning what you're good at, the skill set, and the method that works. Yeah. And yes, yeah, yeah. there's loads of noise out there and information about how you could do things. But ultimately, I do agree with you on this. It's about experimenting and finding what's right for you and just making some choices around how you want to spend your time. And it's also by doing sort of different things as well, because people get kind of stuck in a rut. So tomorrow, I'm going to go see the Russell Howard show being filmed. I'm going oh, to put myself because my flatmate dropped out. But just um, going to different places and doing different things. 
and eat. So people want to, this is, I'll, I'll finish on this one. I know you've got to go. So a lot of people want to make a massive change in their life. Yeah. Yet they're not able to make a small change. So for example, most people have the same six or seven meals That's all, right. all the time. Yeah. So and it's like, you know, when like most people have a very structured life and like they will always have a takeaway on a Friday and whatever it is. And if you say to them, instead of ordering that pizza, why don't you order this pizza? They were like, are you mad? <laughs> you know what I mean? Of course I'm not gonna, of course I'm not gonna have a madras rather than that, you know. Yeah. And so you want to be a multimillionaire or you want to be the but you can't change a meal. Yeah. So so what you want to do is you want to learn about variety in, in what you do. So I I'm always changing my diet, I'm always cooking different things and going to different places and experiencing different things. Um and, and yeah, it's, it's so it's about, you know, change is not one, um, oh, one. And the thing is, if you do a massive change, and this is what I've found. So I've worked with people who've had like gastric band surgery. I've worked with people who have won a lot of money, inherited a lot of money, um, or just got a lot of money for some reason. And they think what you think the solution is to your problem is, is not the solution. And you shouldn't be making goals when you're in a problem. So the fat person wants to be skinny, not just healthy weight, but skinny. The poor person wants to be rich, not just comfortable. So what would the work that I kind of do is I get them from one end of the perspective, just to the middle, mm. rather than going the other way. Because the thing is, if you're broke, it's because you're bad with money. And if I give you a million pounds, you're, you've just got a lot of reason, a lot of resources to ruin your life. If you look at the lottery winners. Yeah. Look at yo-yo dieters, yeah. you know, you look at, so people will tend to be one or the other. I try to bring people to the normal middle. Because the thing is, when you feel okay, you don't need to feel great and powerful. I have no desire to feel great and powerful. And like, and the, the thing is, the, the self-development the self industry feeds off people with insecurity who feel like rubbish and they feel beneath and unworthy and they're making them stand and obviously if you get all your sort of adrenaline and everything you're, you feel great but you've not achieved anything you've just stood on a chair and hugged a stranger but you've not you know you've yeah. not changed your, you your job in place yeah. afterwards um matt if people want to uh, find you some more we're going to put all your uh links yeah. into the show notes because it sounds like i'm going to check out your your youtube and your uh, oh it's fun yeah it's good it's good that's <laughs> really good thank you so much for your You're very welcome uh good luck for the rest of your day chilling out and watching a movie i love it thank you